All right, welcome to today's show. Uh, this is the old man. I'm Otis McGregor, and the kid. I'm Camden McGregor. And today we're gonna we're gonna talk to you a little bit about how business and sports relate. You know, and I think this is important because you know we're both sports fans. Uh, a lot of America loves their sports. I mean, even the world. When you step it out, you know, just outside of our our culture, really loves sports. And sports is a great analogy for life. Uh, you know, one of my favorite philosophers of all time is Yogi Berra. You know, and and so many times in his books and his talks, he talks about how life reflects baseball. And, and you know, that's all tongue-in-cheek with Yogi. But it's great stuff, and, and there's great analysis uh, there in it. And, you know, even, the, even this morning, just talking with one of my coaching clients, about performance and and how we look at high level athletes but us in the business world also have to perform and what we can do to increase our performance and how we can how we can uh, be a better performer better salesman better leader and have a better vision for what we're trying to do and what we're trying to be successful at um, and I think that you, know, you talk about sports reflecting life. There's no more pure form of emotion out there than sports that I've ever seen. Um, the story I heard a while back, they're talking about being in a locker room after a big game. Where else can you go and you see 35 grown men in tears hugging each other? And no shame or anything about that. Where else is that culturally okay except for in the football locker room after a game or after a rugby match? And it's that pure emotion, that pure, uh, you know, the, the meritocracy of it, of, you know, you did everything you can. It's all about you working hard and getting that pure form of competition. And, you know, life isn't always as pure like that, but that's why we like sports because it take, takes something a lot messier and makes it more pure, adds some more rules to it. No, that's, that's, that's very, very true. And it's a, it's a unique aspect of sports because, you know, in, in the real world, in business, and I hate saying real world, people used to say that to me in the military. And if this was real, we'd do it this way. But that's, we all know that's BS. If it was real, you'd do it the right way every time, right? Yes, so sir. We're gonna train. We're going to train for how we're going to do this all the time and not real world stuff if you saw my fingers doing the air quotes. But when we do these things, when we, when we look at where we're going to go and how we're going to grow our business, it's a day in, day out sort of game. And it's really follows that similarity. Uh, and I'll come back to the team aspect I was talking about just a minute ago, but it follows that similarity of, of, of how you prepare each and every day on in sports on the practice field in business in the office and in your meetings and things like that for that opportunity when that opportunity arises are you going to be ready in sports it's very finite right sports we have that opportunity we we know our game schedule we know when the tournament's coming around and we can put those marks on our wall and our calendar and move forward that way but in business the 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 win isn't as as clear there's no one one or zero there's no win or loss on anything in the business world it continues on i think uh i have a great example of that to make it pretty personal with uh, my meeting last week for uh, opportunities with our investors it's my first big meeting with the investors and i know i talked with you afterwards and i was in that crap i'm just missed a tackle mode of you know i you know they're the reason we only won by one try or the reason that was such a close game is because I messed up. Now I know as a coach that that's not true and there's always so much more that boils down to it. But when you're in the heat of the moment, all you can think about is that one missed tackle or if you had ran a little bit harder, but you know, just like you said, it's not as clear in business. Uh, I left there trying not to be down on myself because I was thinking about the negative aspects, but in reality, that's a preliminary meeting. We're still working together and we're moving forward and making progress. Um, it's just a different type of world. No, that that you're spot on. When you change that that idea, I mean, it's, it is no different than sports. How could I have made that tackle better? How could I have, you know, completed that play just a little bit better? You know, in, in football, how could I have gained one more yard and made a first down on that play instead of it being 
third and short, it'd be first and 10. Right. And if we look at those things and we, and we take that, that thought and that idea of, of that performance and how we can tweak that performance to make it just a wee bit better, those incremental changes, we can do the same thing in business. Every time we, we have a meeting, every time uh, we go to a networking event, we have a sales call, and you name it, you can take that time and look and say, well, how could that have been better? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? Or what, what could we just do just a little bit better and tweak it and create efficiencies and, and create more opportunities for us when we go forward and do it the next time? Or even if it's not an exact iteration of, the, of that meeting or that sales call, how can I take what I've learned and apply it to this next thing? Right. Definitely. And being able to make those type of incremental improvements and uh, it can really be the difference, especially in sports. That's the difference between, you know, being a good athlete and being a great athlete. Um, we've talked before about, and now this can be a terrible example because I'm never was good at basketball, but we talked about Steph Curry shooting the ball and how he's, you know, the way you put it was he's really good at putting the ball in the round hole and that's it. And he figured out a way that he can do that no matter what the situation is, no matter where he is on the court. And that's what's so impressive about him. But being able to step back, look at yourself and uh, eye your technique of whatever it is, you know, for basketball, if it's your follow through or, you know, that's really my one example I have shows how much I know. But and then you go into business and it's the same type of thing. And you can go in and you can step back and say, OK, you know, I came in, uh, for example, my meeting last week. I came in way too nervous. I needed to come in excited, ready to go, fired up about my business. But I came in too nervous about this big situation I was stepping into. And being able to step back, reflect on yourself, and visualize how you can improve in the future, uh, just like sports and business. Yeah, wow, you hit on so many good things. Uh, visualization, nervousness. You know, I, I'm a firm believer if, if you're not nervous when you go to do something, mm -hmm then you're not challenging yourself, right? So you were stepping out of your comfort zone last week. Yeah, you could have visualized it more, walked, walked yourself through it, and that would have helped. But if you still aren't getting those butterflies, then how much are you truly pushing yourself out of your comfort zone? Because that's, that, that's what that nervousness is, right? It, it's, right. It's we are, if we're comfortable, we don't get nervous. And if we're comfortable, we're not changing. So how do we grow and how do we take, take that next step level that next step of growth and one of the ways is you step out of your comfort zone and that meeting for you last week that was your first one ticking off ticking off in the entrepreneur startup world presenting your idea to a complete outsider who's looking to invest in your idea and right. validate that yeah what your idea is with opportunities is a pretty good idea and I'm I believe in you as a leader and I believe in the business and they're willing to write a check. That's a, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, and I think uh, that's something that I took from rugby and I've been trying to apply the rest of my life. Uh, the, the best example I have for it right now is coaching. Um, when I started working with the Engage Foundation, our first league, we had 60 kids RSVP'd. And I had been an assistant coach. That's it. And I, for anyone who hasn't been coaching before, assistant coach is the best job in the world because you get to provide all of the advice. You get to joke with the players and stuff, but you handle zero logistics or anything like that. Um, when you and I coach together, the kids would come up to me and say, hey, Coach Cam, you know, when are we leaving for the game? And I go, I don't know. Ask Otis. Like, that's not my job. My job is to make sure you perform properly properly on the field is to make sure you pass the ball right that's and uh, making that jump from assistant coach to head coach is huge there's a lot more pressure on you you know I had 10 volunteers showing up who needed to know what drills to run how to run those drills and all those type of things I wasn't in there teaching one kid how to pass I was teaching 60 kids how to do everything and uh, but I had the moment the day before where I was thinking like I've never done this I am so nervous. You know, what if I fail? What if I just make a complete joke out of myself and, you know, embarrass myself instead of these 60 kids and all of their parents. But, you know, I kind of looked back to uh, playing rugby and how the same type of thing, if you're not nervous before something, you're not, then you're not doing the right job of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. And uh, I can look back at all my great rugby moments or my great schooling moments or tests or anything like that. And I could say very confidently that I was nervous before just about every one of those. 
and that's okay because that nervousness means you're alive. It means you're pushing yourself. Uh, you know, to go back to the schooling example, I know that the tests where I walked down and goes, went, oh gosh, like I, I missed a few questions on that. Those were my best test scores. When you walked down and said, man, I killed that thing. Yeah, you failed it because you weren't smart enough to know that you messed up. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's great. How can you, uh, I'll throw this at you. How can you take that same attitude, that same uh, realization of I screwed this up or I knocked it out of the park and apply it in business. Um, I mean, I think it's just the same type of thing, being able to isolate it, look back at yourself objectively, see what you did and try to, you know, get that third person perspective on it of what was really going on there, how you could improve it. Um, and really trying to look for the actual effects of what's happening. So this is something, uh, I say all the time with like the behavioral economics stuff, there's so many variables that are going on in a situation. You can get critical about yourself, yourself or the way you said something though. A lot of those things don't really matter. No one, you know, it's uh, the self-awareness bias. No one else is paying as close of attention to you as you are. And if you get nitpicky about little tiny things, instead of focusing on your overall element, then in the overall productivity, you know, reaching that end goal, um, then you're just limiting yourself that way. And I think that can work with sports or business. Yeah, it can. But I'll, I'll, I'll counter you with that is if I'm, if I'm a high level athlete, then those little things are the things that I can tweak. It's how I grab the baseball. Do I twist it in my glove to the right or to the left to grab my four, my four seam uh, right. pitch, you know, do. And I think that's the, that's the real effect. So if you, um, I'll take another sports example. When I first got to U of A to play rugby, um, my footwork for lineouts was terrible. And that was one of those things I worked on and I was getting up in the air, you know, one second faster in every lineout. And that, but that one second really made the big difference. So you do take those changes and move on. So like in sports, those small incremental changes, you know, incremental changes in everything uh, can have a marginal effect that pays off in the long run. Um, but what I was more referring to is things that don't actually wind up mattering you know, insignificant things like if uh, you mispronounce a word or have to restart a sentence because you were stumbling over your words, those type of things aren't necessarily going to sink your ship if you're still making your larger point across. Exactly. And you overcome those with confidence, right? Because you have the confidence in yourself and your ability to perform in this performance sales call meeting, presentation, and at bat, if you're a baseball player, you have your you have to have that confidence in yourself to perform and not get wrapped around the axle about something that went wrong or not quite right as you visualized it. Is that thing going to affect the outcome? And that's one and of the wonderful things to start to understand is is if my outcome is to hit the ball, if my outcome is to hit a home run, if my outcome is to uh, close the sales deal, close the, the, uh, the, the venture capital support in my business. If I, if I stumble and stutter on a sentence or hit the wrong slide or whatever, how do you, how do I fix that in the moment? And that's, that's one of the things that's where you start to, not only do you have that confidence in yourself of how to get yourself better and perform and get the outcome that you desire, but that's also how you can get better and better at who you are and what you do going forward with anything else. Um, I think that confidence, a big piece of that is uh, the way I like to put it is the power of, I don't know. So this is something it's uh, sort of a fallacy that a lot of people fall into is that if you say, I don't know, then you'll come off looking stupid. Like you don't know what you're talking about. Whereas in reality, if you're giving a presentation on something and somebody asks you a question and you, and you say, I don't know. I haven't researched on that, but I would love to hear what your opinion on, is on it. And I would love to talk to you more about it after I'm done with my presentation and those type of things. You just looked at them in the eye and you said, I don't know what you're talking about, but because you played it off that way, it makes yourself look humble. Like you know enough that you know, you don't know everything. Um, if you go in and you think you're the biggest expert in the room, then somebody's going to wind up making you look stupid. If you go in and with an open mind that some other people might have other opinions on things, then you can perform much better and you can come off much more confidently that way. 
Uh, you got to be confident with where you are. Don't uh, oversell yourself. Don't be overconfident. Uh, just be confident with where you are and what you can perform at. Well, overconfident is, is no longer confident. It's cocky, isn't it? Right. <laughs> right. Very that, true. That's what you're really talking about. And those people that believe they're the smartest person in the room never get anywhere. I mean, if, if you if you look around the room and, and you believe that you're the smartest person in the room, there's something wrong with you or you're in the wrong room. You know, you're in the room with a bunch of fifth graders. Well, I challenge you. Remember that TV show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader with uh, was it Jeff Foxworthy? Yes, sir. I mean, come on. You know, <laughs> th those fifth graders were kicking a lot of adult butts and in, in knowledge and, and basic understanding of things. So what's that say about you if, you're, if you believe that you're the smartest person in the room? How, how good of a leader, team player are you going to be if you're that guy, you know, standing up in front of the room with your hands on your hips saying, I'm smarter than all you people there. None of your information matters. And what's that do to your team? Creates a terrible team environment, I would say. And uh, that's something I've talked about a lot with uh, the team I'm putting together for opportunities is we want to get a bunch of people. So an easy example uh, on our team is Dr. Quello, who has the PhD. He's, you know, top, easily top 10 in the world as far as sustainable agriculture goes. But he lets me ask all my stupid questions and let me think outside the box because he knows he doesn't know everything. And if you come in and you don't know what you're talking about, sometimes you have the best ideas because when you're, when you're working with something in your entire life, you get so uh, caught up in your own ways that you can't think outside the box anymore. Um, an example of that, talking about creativity, uh, most creative geniuses, you can be an incremental creative genius or you can be an explosive creative genius. Incremental creative geniuses are, um, so Da Vinci would be a great example. He was kind of working up towards his greatest work his entire life. He was always building his way up. Whereas other artists, they had their best work when uh, they were very young. I think Bob Dylan uh, released like a Rolling Stone when he was, I want to say, 24. Mm -hmm. So it's whether you're young or young in the field. So if you come in with an outside perspective and you start asking the, what if you want to call them stupid questions, a lot of those questions aren't that stupid. And if you have a team who is, uh, has enough humility to look at themselves and know that they don't know everything and take those outside the box questions and really think about them, that's where you can get a lot of innovation. And you know that, yeah, that's the more explosive innovation, not incremental, but it's innovation nonetheless. Yeah. Well, and you touched on something that's, uh, kind of brought us back into the sports realm again was with the team, you know, and it's such a, you know, teams are formed to solve complex problems, right? We don't just gather up, you know, you can go back and, you know, go back to prehistoric man sort of stuff and, you know, and hunting parties and, and how those hunting parties, the reason we had hunting parties because they were taking down bigger game and it was easier to, take down, a, you know, an animal or put multiple people out there so you could take down more animals and, and bring more back to the village to feed the people. Well, that's simple. That's, that's an oversimplification, but it still works and applies because now when we have more minds working together, you get more solutions. It's, you know, it's the power of multiple multiplicity uh, or, or whatever, you know, it's truly called, but you know, it's, Right. It's, the, it's the sum of the whole is greater than the parts because I've got, if I've got five smart people working on a problem, then that's a heck of a lot better than five individuals working on five separate problems. Cause we're going to, we're going to come up with more efficient and creative solutions to move forward to solve that problem with those, with a five person team. than we will, if, if I put each of you into a box and have you, Focus in, focus on a solution by yourself, and when we're in, we're in that team environment in sports, it's the same thing. We're working together for a common goal, a common outcome, as a team. And you know, one of the things that you hear about a lot in uh, in teams, sports teams, is is that chemistry. What is the that team doesn't have the chemistry to perform. Mm -hmm. How many championships have been won by a team that has okay talent on it, but not the best talent or, right. you know, how many teams can you think of uh, that, that have, that have paid for the best talent, 
to be on their team but can't win a championship. Right. Um, I think that kind of ties into like complementary skill sets when you're building a team. So this is something you can see in business and in sports. Um, so to take the rugby example, you have specialized positions out on the pitch and those people need to be able to perform those specific tasks. Yeah, everyone needs to be able to run the ball. Everyone needs to be able to tackle. But there's specific skills that need to be performed by certain players. If you didn't have that complementary skill sets where you have different players doing it, like just for example, you have 15 props on the field or 15 wings, you're never going to win a rugby game because you don't need that many of one type of person. You need all these different types of people who are performing different types of jobs and all working towards that common goal. Um, and I think that ties really well into the division of labor to go back to my more econ side of it. So when you're uh, with your team, you know, just like if you get a team working towards a common goal, uh, it works better. But also you need to, to be able to uh, take those complementary skill sets and inside that team and then divide the labor up that, that way. So if you have people who are, for, for my example, with opportunities who are more experienced with growing the plants, um, and working with the vegetables and those type of things. Those are the people I put in charge of designing our grow systems. Whereas because I have more of a business background, I'm writing the business plan. I'm going out, making the phone calls, having a lot of those type of meetings. Um, for uh, our CMO, she's handling all the marketing, social media, all those type of things. We can all do those different things, but because we split ourselves up, that division of labor, we're able to be more productive in our own specialized fields but that complementary skill sets because we are still a team tied together and we're working towards that common goal, even in our different fields. No, uh, that's, that's great. And you, and you just, you know, touched on one of my favorite subjects from uh, Jim Collins book, uh, good to great, you know, it's right person, right seat sort of things. And Jim, Jim's analogy is, is your business is a bus and you got all this talent on the bus. And then one of the things that you do as a leader to make your business great is you get that right person in that right seat. And, you know, sports is a great analogy for that. And, and for those of you who aren't familiar with rugby, the prop, props are the front row guys that we call them. They're, they're the big, big guys that uh, run around and do a lot of the heavy lifting in the game. Wings, wings are, think, wide receivers in the NFL. They're, so if you think props are, are uh, offensive linemen, and wings are the wide receivers. That's kind of the difference. And you can see that even in a, a football game. You can't win a game with nothing but 11 offensive linemen out there or 11 wide receivers. You have to have – I'd pay good money to see that, though. Yeah, it would be, it would be fun to see. Uh, uh, that would be a great experiment. Maybe we should call uh, Roger Goodell and ask him if we could try that out uh, during preseason. But They need something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's – it, it's, a, it's allowing your team, the people on the team, to do the job that they're hired to do. Um, I think with your, uh, your bus analogy, that immediately brought to mind uh, the endurance uh, book you loaned me about Ernest Shackleton and uh, his Antarctic trek. And the, the easiest example, there's so many examples of just amazing leadership qualities inside that book. But I think the most interesting is when he talks about how put he designed where people were sleeping around making sure that the jerks and the pushovers weren't next to each other because he knew that they would he would bully them to death pretty much and that he knows that if he put you know these two guys in a boat together one of them's going to wind up going overboard but if he puts them all in the right way he kept that uh he kept the team chemistry if you will right with uh, how many people do you have 27 uh 30 somewhere in there um and dividing them up into those small groups that they're not going to kill each other and making sure that you're eliminating those risk factors. Um, he talks about, and I don't have the guy's name in front of me, but um, one of the engineers who was giving him problems the entire expedition was mm -hmm. pushing back on him the whole time. He took him on his final voyage when he went off to rescue, for, uh, to get help to rescue everybody else. Because he knew if he left that man on the island, there was going to be a mutiny, there was going to be hell to pay <laughs> if he left that man back even if he wasn't in charge something was going to go wrong and so he made sure he kept him right next to him it's kind of that uh keep your friends close to your enemies closer type thing oh yeah yeah no that's that's a great point about who you know the, those right people and, and and fitting them in and then you know to talk about Shackleton and that leadership perspective and that understanding he had of each individual on his team in order 
you know, that, that, that level of personal understanding is, uh, you know, it's taken for granted a lot of times in, in, uh, in business and, and in any other organization, because if you don't understand that person, what makes that person tick, what makes them, uh, what gets them excited, what motivates them, then how can you truly tap into the, the full capability of that person and give them the opportunity to fully succeed? Yeah, Shackleton, that, that's a, yeah, if, if you haven't read that book, uh, Endurance, Shackleton's book about his expedition, the failed expedition to uh, uh, get to the South Pole. And, trek, a, know, trek across the uh, Antarctica. He had already gotten beat into the South Pole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that right there is, is an amazing story of leadership, and I, I highly recommend you pick that up. And, and there's a lot to learn from those situations that, uh, that he led his team through uh, to help so many, to save all but, what, one or two of them in a, in a horrific environment. Definitely. Um, and I think that this kind of ties interesting and one of the things I'd written down was talking about how your team changes over time. So you have different ways that people perform in different settings. And so, you know, take the Shackleton example, he's like the magic bullet cure because he picked these guys for when things were good and they did just as well when things were terrible. He, you know, you talk about him reading people. He's probably one of the better people in history since he was able to do that and keep those men together and working towards a common goal in such terrible circumstances. Um, but you look at, you know, business and sports, you have those different situations. Uh, so I've had this a lot with potential partners and those type of things where you go in and you interview and you kind of go through that preliminary. Okay. What do I do? What do you do? How could we possibly help each other? And then, you know, a week later you get on a phone call when you're thinking about calling them your partner or you do call them your partner now and you have to rely on them. And all of a sudden they're not answering emails. They're not consistent. Those type of, you know, they're not able to perform at that level, but they performed really well when you interviewed them. Um, you have the same type of thing in rugby. Uh, we, I know we dealt with this a lot with the all state team. Uh, we had kids that are practice all stars and then kids that are game all stars. And a lot of those kids are terrible at the other one. Just, you know, we, uh, when the year that we selected based off scrimmages, how many kids do we have that couldn't pass the ball very well? Way too many. The year we selected off of skills, how many kids do we have that couldn't, you know, run in a straight line or couldn't make a, a tackle in the open field? You, you have that lapses in performance because some people can't perform at their higher level at certain times. You have to be able to look and see where that skill is coming from and see where you'll be able to apply that for the team. Yeah, well, and that's – that's uh, that's a tough thing to to figure out how to do and how to get to that point, uh, because how long is your interview process? I mean, just to stay in that sort of respect. And right. if you think about uh, in the sports realm, and probably the best analogy uh, in professional sports is the draft. And you mm -hmm. look at what they're doing, what the NFL does with players and these every so often it'll come out all these weird sort of questions they're asking players. And so it's not just the physicality, it's, it's the mental aspect of the player. And uh, I know I'm going to fumble this, uh, this quote up, but it was a, uh, it was a Bo Schembechler quote uh, when he was the uh, coach at the university of Michigan, I believe if I remember right. And what he was talking about, a reporter asked him, about a blue chipper that uh, that he didn't recruit, didn't get on his team. And what the coach told the reporter was that that individual wasn't a good fit for my team. He had all this beautiful talent. He was a super fast runner, great ball carrier, but he wasn't the right fit for the team. And what the coach told the reporter is that if I had that kid on my team, if I had that player on my team, he would beat us every single day. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's playing for Michigan State instead of University of Michigan, he has the opportunity to beat us once a year. Yep. And that, that to me is, is a really – when you take that kind of perspective on an individual and their skills and putting somebody on your business team or your sports team, how they fit into that is one of the things I think is – is really a critical piece of having that right person in the right seat on on your team. I think that uh, you know it's it's all team culture really. Um, for to take the rugby example, if you have a kid out there who's not wanting to do his work, who's 
not wanting to go out and support his mates. He doesn't want to be listening to the coach. He doesn't want to do the fitness, you know, all those type of things. That's undermining the team culture that you're trying to build. Um, and then in business, it's the same type of thing. Do you have somebody who's undermining the team culture by questioning things all the time or, you know, getting hung up on things, being negative, whatever it is, that's stopping you from performing at your best. Um, I know I uh, won't get too specific because I might hurt someone's feelings, but I know I have had some experience with that recently. And it's people who, you know, they, they, in their mind, they think they're doing the best, but it's not working together as a team. And then I, you know, I was spending days stressing out about stupid problems instead of running my business and those type of things. And if, you, if you're going to be stressing out about some small nitpicky problem because there's a person on your team who wants to make that the top priority instead of thinking about your big meeting next week with your investors, that's a problem that's hurting your team culture and that's hurting your performance. Oh, it's, that's, that's so true. And it becomes a uh, distraction for you, you know. It takes away your ability to focus on what's important and distracts your energy because now you're diluting. You know, there's, there's only so much capacity, so much time. Time is finite, right? Right. Uh, whatever that quote is, I think it was on a, a commercial of some kind. If, if time is finite or infinite, why is there never enough, enough of it? Well, that's, that's true. However, there's only 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. That's the way it's set out. So you can right. only spend so much time doing things. And when you spend 90% of your time on 10% of the, of the problem set, then what's that do to your business? What's that do to your team? I mean, I can think of being in the, that position uh, when I was in the army with, you know, you get a, you, the, you know, the infamous bad apple in the barrel sort of thing and you end up as a leader spending more time taking care of those those poor performance people than you do getting to accomplish your mission and, and training the rest of the team to get where they need to be. So how do you handle that? And one of the things that you have to do is you have to recognize that very rapidly and then change it. And there's any way of changing it from firing the person to uh, retraining them other than that, if they're not going to change the way that they perform and the way their attitude, then they're, a, they're that cancer to your team. And a cancer eats away at the team's ability to perform at its top level, whether we're talking sports or in business. Um, definitely. And I think, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, incremental improvements and those type of marginal, marginal innovations or marginal changes that have that greater effect. Well, you can think about that in the inverse way as well. So that bad apple, he might not, uh, so we'll take the rugby example again. You got 30 kids on the team. You have one bad apple. You know, he might not be getting everyone to go skip practice to go smoke dope in the parking lot, but he's still going to be having some issues and he's still going to be that negative aspect where, um, you know, if he's only having you, if he's, if his negative attitude is only causing a, decrease the performance by 5%. Well, just like the 5% improvement makes a difference, that 5% uh, disimprovement, that's probably not the right word, 5% uh, <laughs> uh, negative change is not going, is going to have that same type of effect except it's going to be negative. Um, that's, that, those type of small changes can be the difference between your team performing, your team not performing. Yeah, uh, it's so true. And uh, thanks for that ding reminder of uh... – yeah, a, a rugby player being out in the uh, parking lot smoking dope instead of at practice. Yeah, <laughs> I thought I I didn't didn't know that that was going to come up today. But hey, uh, yeah, just to kind of wrap it up, I'd, I'd like to throw out a couple of things that I thought were were super interesting and really apply to kind of summarize it is, is you know if being that leader going back to Shackleton, one of my favorite leadership people is is knowing your team and knowing each individual in your team and how they, how they fit and work together. And, and what are the, you know, what are those, uh, those X factors, if you will, that their inner relations with other people, you can put them with to create a stronger organization. Or in that case, when you were talking about as chief engineer, how you can take that person out of a situation so that it doesn't create that problem set that you have to do with and, 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 you know, create a cancer in your organization? Um, I think for me, a couple big things out of this. Um, so uh, instead of 
saying something again, I've got two things I think summarize it pretty well. So you talk about having a team. Um, you and I were talking about this the other day, a Matt Duchesne interview. They asked him, you know, being an unrestricted free agent, do you want to go be the big name somewhere? And he said, no, I don't want to be the big name because the big names don't win. You need a team to win. And it's the same thing, you know, you need those complementary skill sets, you need that division of labor, you need to be working together towards a common goal. And that's where it really comes from. If you're performing on your own, even as an entrepreneur or anything else, you are much going to be much more likely to fail because you don't have the help from a team. Um, and good then on the Dutchie thing, to say that, by the way. I, good on him to say that. Good job, Dutchie. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, I really enjoyed that interview. Um, he's a good guy. Um, and then the other, the other one, uh, one liner to put out, and this is a good one is luck is when opportunity meets preparation. So when you're going through the business world, it, you can consider it lucky that you were at a networking event and something came together or that you had, uh, your team performed as well as they did. But really it's you being prepared for that situation, you putting the right people in the right seats, you making sure that your team's going to be working together that preparation, then when the opportunity comes, you're ready to execute on it. Um, you know, that's not luck. That's just opportunity. No, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. I believe in that hundred percent myself is that, you know, we don't create luck. We're there with opportunities and the opportunities you can call it luck, but we are creating that opportunity. Definitely. Hey. If you have the right team together and you have the right plan and all those type of things, you're going to see all of those opportunities or going to be really lucky, whichever way you want to think about it. Oh, great. Hey, uh, and thank you all for uh, listening to the old man, and the kid, our inaugural show. Uh, looking forward to talking with y'all more in the future and, and helping, uh, helping you grow as, as leaders in business and sports and uh, the world. And uh, I'm Otis, uh, the old man. And, and I'm Camden, the kid. And thank you all for listening and have a great rest of your day.